Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett, televising from sunny Miami. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having Roland Torres, a neurosurgeon uh, that's practicing in Anchorage, Alaska. He's going to talk about neurotrauma, and we're also joined by a few distinguished panelists, and we may have some that join us along the way. But first, we'll start with Slavin. Good evening, Slavin. Good evening, Slavin. Good evening. My name is Slavin Gorkovic. I'm in Zagreb, Croatia. It's midnight now, but uh, I'm very glad that I can participate in this discussion, and I'm looking forward for this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, welcome, and Roland uh, Slavin's a superstar, a, neuro a neurosurgery superstar student. You'll, yeah, you'll see yeah, yeah. Simon, good evening. Simon. Oh, good evening. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm in uh, Tokyo, Japan. I'm a developmental psychologist and medical student and neurosurgery enthusiast. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Welcome, Simon. Okay, Roland, it's all yours. Welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you for your introduction. So let me uh, let me let's start the slide set up here, and you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit uh, technically handicapped. That's okay. We're all slow at the start. Um, here we go. There you go. Yep, we see it. Okay, so um, I'm a, John asked me to give a talk because he knows that I'm a, a neurotrauma and neurocritical care expert. Uh, until recently, I this is me in the former life. As you can see, I used to be the trauma person at the at Stanford. But that's not why you came here to to talk to hear me or listen to my talk. Really, when we talk about traumatic brain injury. How do we how do we uh, how do we you know, differentiate? How do we uh, uh, treat? What is it we need to do to come up with a, a, a proper algorithm? When we look at the up in the left hand corner, your standard lowly epidural hematoma, you know, which is different from your contusion or your intraparenchymal hematoma, which is different from your diffuse axonal injury. Then your we have your uh, acute subdural hematoma and your uh, acute uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage or intraventricular hemorrhage. And then lastly, you have a picture that looks like this, and this is what you would see in diffuse anoxic injury, a, a complete uh, loss of gray and white uh, matter or differentiation. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the traumatic injury and, and how to deal with it and evidence-based management. This is a former patient of mine in New York, surprisingly enough, he survived this. When in the in the computer era, even skull X-rays are sometimes useful, as you can see here from the previous patient. This I've had more than a couple of these now, and you know I used to ask Gulf War veterans what they thought this was, but what really what it really is is a number seven iron after a uh, enthusiastic discussion uh, between a couple of golfers. This is what the uh, actual picture up close looked like and he was taken to the operating room and uh, he also survived. When we look at the epidemiology of head injury, there are probably an estimated 5.3 million Americans. That's a little bit more than 2% of the U.S. population currently living with disabilities resulting from brain injury. And this is from the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. As you know, this is part of the CDC and this is with a relatively recent uh, uh, um, figure. As we look at the breakdown in TBI in the United States, Probably the most common cause is uh, falls followed by motor vehicle accidents and then different kinds of trauma and assaults. As we look at the breakdown or the pyramid here from the CDC at, tra at traumatic brain injury in the United States, there are approximately 75,000 deaths a year, there are about half a million hospitalizations, about a million and a half emergency room visits, and really it's hard to track because some people you know, get suffer minor concussions or mild TBI and they never go see a doctor or they go see a doc in the box, so-called doc in the box. When we look at traumatic brain injury hospitalizations in California, which is where I spent a lot of time, um, there are about 17,000 males a year, about half as many females, for a total of almost 30,000 traumatic brain injury hospitalizations in California alone. It's interesting, the number, because, and we'll talk about that some more later, uh, now, nowadays in the era of a 19, million, 19 trillion dollar deficit, we need to really look closely at the economic cost or the burden of neurological emergencies. And this is for acute injury in the in cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars for the acute hospitalization period. So the average hospitalization for a traumatic brain injury is $136,000. $200,000 for spinal cord injury, 
And the, when we look at the, the breakdown for all races in the, la in the state of Alaska, as you can see, you know, there's a total of almost 4,000 hospitalizations for traumatic brain injury at, to a cost of about close to $150 million. This is an old slide now, but I, but I like it because it tells a, a good story. The annual cost of traumatic brain injury in the United States alone is equal to sending one of these up, and this is closer to a figure of $80, billion, 80 to $100 billion is the, the, the ballpark currently in today's dollars. When we look at populations who are at risk, who are they? Young people, low-income individuals, unmarried individuals, members of ethnic minorities, residents of inner cities, men, remember the California slide? It's almost always two to one regardless of where in the world you are. Two, two men for every woman uh, has a, is a victim of traumatic brain injury. Individuals with previous history of substance abuse, individuals with a uh, previous traumatic brain injury. When we look at trauma in Alaska, it's the leading cause of death under age 44. Alaska has the second highest trauma mortality in the United States. About 500 Alaskans die each year. Over 1,000 are permanently disabled. And this is approximately 5,000 admissions, hospitalizations uh, in the state of Alaska. This is kind of hard to look, this is kind of a hard, difficult to uh, interpret slide, but basically the bottom line is uh, trauma mortality in the United States. The pink line is all uh, trauma mortality amongst all Alaskans per year. And then lastly, trauma mortality in yellow for Alaskan natives. That is what formerly were known as Eskimos. This is from the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services, the, where they have identified the traumatic brain injuries in Alaska is 20, 28% higher than the national rate. Each year, there are about 250 people that are hospitalized for traumatic brain injury in Anchorage in the Matsu region, which is the adjacent area north of Anchorage. Uh, probably the biggest town, towns there are Eagle River and Wasilla, and Wasilla is the home of uh, none other than the former governor, Sarah Palin. One out of four injured was under the influence of alcohol, and almost half of the traumatic brain injury uh, hospitalizations are under 30 years old. When we talk about penetrating, or so-called penetrating injury, and I just finished a couple of chapters and a couple of atlases, uh, neurosurgery atlases that came out. Uh, there are about 6,000 deaths in the United States due to gunshot wounds to the head a year. Two-thirds are dead at the scene, two-thirds of the rest die in days. A GCS of three is, it corresponds to a less than 1% functional outcome. Traditional dogma teaches us that a bihemispheric shot, a posterior fossa injury, transventricular injury, or self-inflicted gunshot wounds all have exceedingly bad prognosis. Survivors are, of course, sorry. Survivors, of course, at risk for abscess, spinal fluid leaks, epilepsy, in addition to whatever neural deficit they've incurred from their, from their uh, shooting. It comes to mind the concept of trauma systems. Uh, this article from 1999, it was actually in the 90s that people really started paying close attention to trauma systems and traumatic brain injury in general. The, in this art, one article, which is a seminal article, they showed that there's a 15 to 20 percent improvement in survival of seriously injured with a trauma system. An inclusive system was best. It allowed, uh, increased productive working years and improved statewide disaster preparedness as well. I love this next slide because what you'll see is the, the uh, impact of trauma systems in blue in each city, in each major city where there was previously substantial tra trauma, uh, is before the trauma system was activated, and, that, and the uh, uh, copper or brown, light brown after a trauma system was started. So. In San Diego, it went from 15% preventable deaths to less than 5% preventable deaths. In Los Angeles, it went from 35% preventable deaths down to about 15%. And then in Tampa, Florida, another uh, hotbed, uh, somewhere around 25% preventable deaths prior to a trauma system and less than f around 5% after the trauma systems were installed. This is an early uh, article that was in Critical Care Medicine in 1995. This is a good friend of mine, Jam Gajar, who is now the head of the Brain Trauma Foundation in New York. When I left Stanford, my old boss recruited him to come to California. So Jam and the Brain Trauma Foundation are now in Palo Alto. Jam 
did this review with uh, Russ Patterson, who was at the time the chair at the Cornell, and they looked at 219 hospital ICUs in 45 states that treated patients with severe head injury. So what they found was that routine ICP monitoring only occurred about 28% of the time. This is 1995, just about a little bit over 20 years ago. They found out that 83% of these hospitals were hyperventilating and using osmotic, osmotic diuretics routinely. They were shooting for a goal of a PCO2 of less than 25 milliliters of mercury and more cortical steroids, mostly decadrons, being used more than half the time. So, what, you know, in essence, what they found was that ICP monitoring was being used infrequently, that severe hyperventilation was being uh, done, there was injudicious use of steroids, which are really nowadays currently not indicated, but overall, as you can see by now, there was a, a wide variability in practice. What they found that was helpful or that reduced uh, morbidity and mortality was rapid transport to a trauma care facility, prompt resuscitation. CT scanning, prompt with the accident on prompt evacuation of significant intracranial hematomas, and ICP monitoring and treatment were all substantial contributors to re reducing mortality and morbidity. And this is from the Journal of Trauma in 1990, and this is Robert Smith's group. Uh, and what they looked at was the impact of volume on outcome in the seriously injured trauma patients. And this is in Chicago, of all places, where we know there's, uh, especially nowadays, I'm not sure that, the, and this is my political tune, uh, I'm not sure that all that gun control is, is working. Some days there are as many as 80 people that are shot in, this, in the city of Chicago on a weekend. But they looked at 1,643 trauma patients treated at seven trauma centers with differing annual volumes of trauma patients. And the patients were taken to a low volume trauma center, and this is almost intuitive, but of course we always have to prove things. And so what they found was that they, if you went to a low volume trauma center, you had a 30% greater chance of dying. This is from Ellen McKenzie's group at Hopkins, and they looked at the effect of trauma center care on mortality, and what they found was very similar findings. This is for, they looked at they she looked at 18 level one trauma centers and 51 non-level one trauma centers, and you know essentially identifying the risk of death was significantly higher when you went to a non-trauma center. And another uh, article by Jam, uh, and what they what the He and the Brain Trauma Foundation showed in this article is that there's a 50% increase in mortality rates associated with indirect transfer of severe TBI. So if you get scooped up and you get taken to your local hospital uh, where there's no neurosurgeon and they scan you and they do all sorts of studies and you spend hours in the emergency room and then they transfer you to a, an appropriate center, you, you're behind the eight ball basically. When Shackleford and McKenzie looked at the impact of a trauma system on the outcome of severely injured patients, these were all patients with an ISS score of greater than 15. They looked at almost 200 severely injured patients. They had a model predicting survival from a cohort study. Predicted survival was 18%, but if you went to a trauma system, you actual survival was 29%. I won't bore you with the continued number of these studies, but these are all seminal studies that I wanted to put up there. Uh, and, and this particular article, uh, interhospital versus direct scene transfer, this is another observational cohort study with ISS with trauma patients with an ISS score of greater than 15 that went to the University of Virginia. And what they again identified was that patients transported directly to a trauma center uh, had a shorter ICU stay and shorter total hospital stays, although mortality may not have been significantly different. So in about 95, 96, the Brain Trauma Foundation, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, and the Joint Section on Neurotrauma Critical Care came out with the first guidelines on severe head injury. This is the first evidence-based guidelines for the management of TBI. So this is just about 20 years ago that this came out. I figured some of you might be bored, so I throw, threw in this slide. This is the back, uh, this is the back at uh, Indianapolis. When we, uh, when we look at the traumatic brain injury guidelines today, these are the current guidelines. The mo unfortunately, the most recent one, the third edition, came out in May of 2007. There are now surgical guidelines, which came out in 2006. There's pediatric guidelines. There's pre-hospital guidelines. The new fourth edition, uh, which I uh, 
uh, involved in will be coming out uh, in the spring. What the guidelines are really basically based on are methods to reduce intracranial pressure and there are different tiers of, of, of management depending upon the intracranial pressure and of course the patient's uh, physical exam is Glasgow Coma Scale. When we look at the spectrum of traumatic brain injury, how do we divide this? There's mild TBI, which is probably most TBI. It's high risk. It's typically defined as a Glasgow Coma Scale of 14 to 15. There may be some neurological deficit. Up to about 10% have a hematoma that requires surgery. And anyone with a coagulopathy, a drug alcohol consumption, epilepsy, or interestingly enough, if you're age over 60 or previous neurosurgery, puts you at a higher risk. In general, when, when I see patients like this, there's really no CT, CT is really not indicated. Um, or if you've done a negative CT and they have a GCS of 15, you send them home. If they're a GCS of 14, a negative CT scan, I still keep them for 24 hours overnight observation because of that potential 10% risk. When we look at the normal physiology of uh, brain injury, we know that the brain consumes about 20% of total oxygen. It receives about 15 percent of the cardiac output and I think most of us remember this from medical school. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals M MAP minus ICP and there's various ways of deriving the MAP as you can see here. Uh, an important figure to remember is that autoregulation in the brain occurs anywhere from 50 to 150 millimeters of mercury systolic pressure. So moving on to, to the next uh, classification, uh, our moderate traumatic brain injury. This is typically a Glasgow Coma Scale of 9 to 13. It typically represents about 10% of all traumatic brain injury. It has a, carries a less than 20% mortality, about a 50% morbidity, about 40% have a positive CT scan, and less than 10% will actually require neurosurgical intervention. Lastly, we have the severe traumatic brain injury category. This is typically a Glasgow Coma Scale of less than 9. Some people use 8. It represents about 10% of all traumatic brain injury, but about 40% of mortality, and less than 10% make a moderate, reasonable recovery, unfortunately. What are the symptoms and signs of elevated intracranial pressure? There's the classic triad, headache, nausea, vomiting. It may be accompanied with cranial nerve palsies. There may be papilledema, but who, it's, you know, it's hard, who checks papilledema nowadays? Uh, there's certainly vital signs changes. Uh, there's the so-called Cushing's triad, in which you have arterial hypertension, bradycardia, and respiratory changes. Then there's the pathophysiology of what we call secondary injury. And secondary injury is really nothing more than, uh, uh, for example, your patient uh, who's severely head injured and has, several multi is, has multiple monitors in place, your intracranial pressure shoots up, you're obligated to get a repeat CT scan. Well, during that time, the patient has to be transported to the scanner. He's no longer in a ventilator. He no longer follow the parameters. He's probably being bagged on his way to the CT scanner. And so because, he's, because there's not ideal or optimal perfusion, he, this is now accruing a secondary brain injury. When we talk about the cerebral perfusion pressure, remember that this is mean arterial pressure minus ICP. Normal is about 55. It's just a little bit lower, in, uh, about 40 to 50 in children uh, than the elderly. This all comes from the so-called Monroe, Monroe Kelly doctrine, which essentially is the fact that the skull is like a small box, and you know there's only so many things that fit in there, and after that you start creating pressure, abnormal pressure. This is uh, a part of the pathophysiology of injuries from cerebral edema. It's caused by the effects of neurochemical transmitters and by increased intracranial pressure. It's really due to a certain extent to disruption of the blood-brain barrier. There's impairment of your vasomotor autoregulation leading to dilatation of cerebral blood vessels. And for, you may remember from school, there's several different types of uh, cerebral edema. There's basogenic, cytotoxic, and transependymal. Since most of you are uh, neurosurgeons, I will gloss on this uh, uh, little diagram or schematic of the different kinds of herniation. <laughs>
But when you're faced with a uh, with not sure which direction to take, and there have been a number of therapeutic approaches to intracranial hypertension. In 1918, Dr. Cushing came up with so-called tentorial incision, where he would uh, cut the tentorium to relieve pressure in the uh, in the uh, infratentorial space. Dr. Fay came up with osmotic diuretics, 1923, in the form of urea. This was used prior to a, a mantol or hypertonic saline. It popular for a while. Dr. Sesmeyer introduced hypothermia in 1955. The hypothermia, or actually the effects of hypothermia, uh, were actually um, uh, first dis not necessarily discovered, but first written about in the 1700s by uh, Napoleon's surgeon general during the tough uh, French-Russian campaign, where they noticed that French soldiers or Russian soldiers, for that matter, that had been wounded uh, actually survived or lived longer with, in the uh, tough winter when they were hypothermic, and so. This one thing led to another, and this is where the concept of the use of hypothermia uh, was introduced. It was reintroduced uh, in the 90s in the form of NIH studies, but never got, never went really far. It's it's much it's much more useful for those of you who are in emergency rooms in uh, in the setting of a uh, uh, um, cardiac arrest. Dr. Furness came up with the concept of hyperventilation in 1957. Dr. Lundberg uh, had a strong interest in uh, fluid physiology, uh, introduced ventricular drainage in 1960. Joe Galicic and Lyle French uh, uh, identified the use of steroids in brain tumors and thought it would be useful to carry it on to, uh, to um, a traumatic brain injury. We know better now. Dr. Ranselhoff and Dr. Schalberg, among others, introduced decompressive craniectomy. There was recently a large Australian trial which was published in a uh, in New England Journal a few years back on decompressive craniectomy. And unfortunately what they showed is that at six months and a year later that the decompressive hemicraniectomy, which was a randomized study, uh, had poorer outcome than the non the non-hemicraniectomy patients. However, there's a lot of issues regarding the the, uh, the the study and their outcome and of course the uh, the points that they used and, and the the uh, the way that they tried to manage intracranial pressure prior to the surgeries. Uh, Bill Shapiro um, po tried to popularize uh, barbiturates and barbituric uh, uh, use in the, in the 70s for the management of intracranial pressure based upon reducing brain metabolism. What do we, today, some of the ways that we manage elevated intracranial pressure is uh, with airway or ventilated support. Uh, if, you, if your GCS is 9 or 8 or less, obviously that patient needs to be intubated. We want to try to maintain adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. We still use osmotic diuresis. Uh, hypertonic saline has been reintroduced and popularized. It was actually first looked at in cats by the military at the turn of the last century. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's more popular in the pediatric literature than it is in the adult literature. There are no substantial uh, trials which have shown a benefit to using uh, hypertonic saline versus mannitol in the adult uh, traumatic brain injury uh, uh, population. Sedation analgesia, it's used to again to control metabolism. Uh, typically sedation uh, or analgesics or both as well as even uh, um, paralytic agents. As I mentioned, hypothermia no longer is popular. Uh, it's, if you look at the current guidelines, it's a last resort sort of uh, option. Uh, neuromuscular blockade, I mentioned barbiturate coma is up there with hypothermia. Uh, glycemic control, uh, we all, is, is, uh, is a, there's a strong uh, ICU contingency towards glycemic control maintaining it in the hundreds. There is, uh, there's less of a, there, it, there's more tolerance for slightly elevated uh, gl uh, glucose in the uh, in the brain injured patient. Spinal fluid drainage is the immediate. Of course, I touched lightly or mentioned uh, craniectomy. I threw this slide in again for, to remind everybody that there are different tiers of uh, methods to reduce intracranial pressure, and you can find these in the the, the appropriate sections in the guidelines. So. I mentioned secondary injury, and in the past couple of decades, medical research has shown that all brain damage doesn't really occur at the moment of impact, but it really evolves over the next few hours and days. The injured brain is extremely vulnerable to hypotension, 
hypoxia, and increased intracranial pressure. These are all sources of so-called secondary injury. By, I bring this nice perspective study from Italy, which showed a significant association between arterial desaturation and poor outcome. When you, this is a class two study, and uh, Dr. Stachetti, who's a, 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 a very well-known uh, neurotrauma expert in Europe, uh, studied 50 severe traumatic brain injury patients that were rescued by helicopters. They measured, this is a simple study, but elegant study, they looked at pulse oximeters and they broke it down into less than 60%, 60 to 90%, and more than 90%. So if your O2 sats on that helicopter being blown into, being brought into the, heli to the uh, hospital were greater than 90%, your mortality on average was 14.3%, and your severe disability after uh, being brought through your, uh, uh, your acute phase was about, about 5%. If your O2 sats were between 60 and 90 percent, your mortality doubled and your disability skyrocketed, about 27 percent. If your O2 sats were less than 60 percent continuously, there was about a 50 percent mortality rate and about a 50 percent severe disability rate. So from the guidelines, the O2 sats should be measured with a pul continuous pulse oximeter uh, or as often as possible. Uh, hypoxemia should be avoided or corrected immediately, uh, and it should be done by administering supplemental oxygen. An option, a recommended option, uh, treatment option is that airway should be secured in patients with severe head injury, that's to say a GCS of less than nine, someone with an inability to maintain an adequate airway, that's straight from the ATLS guidelines, and hypoxemia not corrected by a uh, uh, it should not be corrected just purely by supplemental oxygen. Uh, endotracheal intubation, if available, is probably the most effective uh, way to maintain the uh, airways. These are, uh, these are uh, to, to remind everybody what normal ventilation is in an adult, it's typically about 10 breaths per minute, in children about 20, in infants about 25 breaths per minute. And hyperventilation, by definition, is a good 20 breaths per minute for adults. 30 for children and 35 for infants. But I mentioned fluid therapy. Really, the most important thing is that adult isotonic fluids should be administered in volumes required to avoid hypotension. Adult hypotension, by definition, in trauma literature is less than 90 millimeters of mercury. The cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained at a minimum of 70 millimeters of mercury. There's literature that says 50 to 70. I think my personal bias is, is, is 70. I, I think we can skip this slide. And in, uh, with respect to uh, uh, the role of secondary brain injury, this is a nice little study, uh, a little older now, from Randy Chestnut and, uh, and Howard Eisenberg, a whole group of uh, other uh, fairly well-known uh, uh, neurotrauma experts like Larry Marshall and Tony Marmaru. This is a prospective study that looked at pre-hospital ER studies of 717 severely head injured patients in the trauma coma data bank. And what they found was that hypotension, that is to say a systolic of less than 90 millimeters of mercury, occurred in about 35 percent of the patients and was associated with a two-fold increase in mortality. So the first priority for the head injured patient is complete and rapid physiological resuscitation. That's really straight out of the ATLS guidelines as well. We really shouldn't attempt any kind of uh, treatment or address intracranial hypertension until the patient is uh, hemodynamically stable. I put this uh, art, this uh, paper from uh, Dr. Young and company and uh, Paul Muslar that to show why uh, it's important that we not hyperventilate patients. When you, they looked at cerebral blood flow using xenon CT in 35 severely head injured patients at an average of three hours after injury. And what they found was global or regional ischemia in 31% of patients. And global ischemia was measured in 57% of, of patients, almost 60% with diffuse swelling. When Raj Narayan and uh, again uh, Jam and Harold Young and others looked at intracranial pressure to monitor or not to monitor, and, uh, they looked at 207 severely head injured patients who had intracranial pressure monitoring and had CT scans. Patients with a normal head CT scan 
had a 13% chan chance of ICP being greater than 20. A risk of intracranial hypertension with normal CT increased to 60% if two or more of the following were noted. That's age over 40, systolic less than 90, or motor posturing. John, are you still there? So, yes, we're, we're here, but... I'm sorry. The, 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 Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I, I, I thought I lost you for a minute. No, no, you still, still go. The slides are very clear. Slides are good. Do any, does anybody have any questions? You want to take a break? I know I'm going a little fast. No, no, it's, okay. it's fine. Are you guys okay? You oh, guys yes, absolutely. We're riveted. Uh, we're, this is excellent. Thank you very much. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Fantastic. Okay, well, we will, we will keep rolling then. Let me get back to... Uh, do you guys have it on your screens? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. So, you know, one of you, some of you may bring up the fact that Randy Chestnut came out with an article recently. Well, it's a couple of years old now. I don't know how he did it. He's a lot smarter than I am, I guess. He got the NIH to pay for a big study, but he did it in Bolivia. And what they did was they randomized uh, patients with severe head injuries to ICP monitoring versus no ICP monitoring. And it, in that country, they do it they, they, like uh, they used to do not too long ago. They scan the patients every day, and of course, they follow the neuro exam closely. And in Bolivia, at least, they, in the Bolivian study, they found that, that ICP monitoring uh, was, did not make as significant a contribution as we had previously uh, you know, come to expect. I think part of the problem is that we, in different economic settings in different countries, we need to uh, tune our guidelines to be able to accommodate the individual countries. I thought I'd throw that in there in case somebody remembered that study that, uh, regarding to, to monitor or not to monitor. So, in the current state of technology, the, the gold standard is probably a ventricular catheter. That's a little draining tube that you insert into the ventricle to drain spinal fluid. When you drain spinal fluid, the, the effect on the intracranial pressure is immediate. Um, the ventricular catheter is connected to an external strain gauge. It's probably the most accurate, low-cost, reliable method of monitoring intracranial pressure. It also, as I said, it allows therapeutic drainage. There's all other ways to do it. The most common or most popular one is so-called Camino monitoring, which is a fiber optic device costs about a thousand or twelve hundred dollars. It's easily breakable, and you know the, one of the things that I dislike about it is that you can't drain. You can only measure. This is schematic of the ideal positioning of a of a of a burr hole so that you can place your uh, uh, ventricular catheter. The, uh, the the standard guideline is a, a centimeter anterior to your coronal suture, and about the mid pupillary line. Uh, in some books, you'll see it says three centimeters from the sinus, in, uh, so the sagittal sinus. That is, in other books, you'll see four centimeters from the sagittal sinus. But that's roughly the uh, landmarks to to freehand these, which are can be done anywhere. They, uh, uh, there's in the past, people used to say it was better in the uh, in the OR. These are done on the floor in the emergency room. I've actually done it in a in the uh, in a in the uh, ambulance, and. Uh, um, there's no there's no difference in terms of the incidence of infection whether you do it or not. As long as there are sterile conditions where you place it, there's no difference in the rate of infection whether you do it in an OR or in the ICU, for example. Uh, this is a non-contrast CT scan showing ideal placement of the catheter, as you can see here, at the uh, confluence of the frame of the Monroe. So. When we talk about guidelines, uh, ICP treatment should be initiated at an upper threshold of 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. And there's a lot of literature now, but this is a seminal article. The, uh, Howard Eisenberg and, and uh, colleagues looked at uh, instability, the impact of ICP instability and hypotension on outcome. What they found was that the ICP threshold that was most predictive of six months outcome and looking at almost 500 severely head injured patients, the proportion of hourly ICP reading greater than 20 was a significant determinant of, of outcome. It should, really should say poor outcome. The longer it was over 20 without being treated, the worse patients did. 
this is what a uh, standard Camino uh, uh, monitor, uh, the fiber optic device that I was uh, referring to, uh, looks like after shaving and prepping the site. It's actually a little bolt that you screw in there, and the fiber optic device goes through the bolt and onto the cortical surface. The other device we use nowadays is, uh, this is my favorite, there are other tissue oxygenation probes, but what they do in particular, these are surface probes and they read, uh, they're, they're like a miniature pulse ox for the brain. They'll tell you what the oxygen saturation is uh, continuously. Uh, so I mentioned perfu cerebral perfusion. Uh, again, Mike Rosner looked at uh, cerebral perfusion, and this is another seminal article which led to the guidelines. He looked at 158 patients with GCS less than seven, and he used a, a CPP protocol, CPP-based protocol. They maintained patients euvolemic, that's a CVP of eight to 10 millimeters of mercury. They drained uh, CSF at 15 millimeters of mercury. They used vasopressors like most of us do nowadays to keep your cerebral perfusion pressure up to a, at least 70. Hyperventilation. Arbitrates, hypothermia were not used. Mortality was 29% and 2% vegetated for the entire group. So there was favorable outcome in GCS of 3, of 35%, up to 75% for GCS of 7. That was a substantial improvement compared to what was previously being done. When we look at what I mentioned earlier that we no longer hyperventilate except as a temporizing measure, temporizing being, you know, the patient comes in, uh, large hematoma, GCS is five, he's intubated, you're waiting for the OR to go, you hyperventilate him to reduce intracranial pressure uh, as, a, uh, as a transient uh, acute measure. From the guidelines, mantol is effective for the control of raised intracranial pressure after severe head injury. Typical dose is anywhere from 0.25 to one gram per kilo. That usually works out to about anywhere from 70 to 100 gram and this is grams, and I typically give it just 100 grams in an emergency. Um, and it works best as a bolus. Don't let the, your anesthesiologist or your emergency room uh, specialist uh, drip it in. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, an option in the guidelines is that uh, the use of mantol prior to ICP monitoring, that you have to have signs of herniation or progressive neurological uh, deterioration that's not attributable to systemic pathology. So, um, the, you know, if your patient is not completely uh, fluid resuscitated, you need to wait until that's all done before you decide it, to address uh, uh, any potential intracranial pressure, again, from the ATLS guidelines. I mentioned high-dose barbiturates. Sorry about that. High-dose barbiturates uh, are, a, uh, in the guidelines, are a, a, at the of last resort, so to speak. It's, uh, it's, it works in some patients. It doesn't work in too many. The basis is that you uh, put them on the barbiturate drip, typically a, a, a pentabarb drip, and uh, you, do, you follow this with continuous EEG, EEG monitoring. And the goal is to extinguish any EEG activity by continuing to increase the barbiturate, the, uh, barbiturate, the barbiturate rate. This is, this is more uh, salvage therapy. I've mentioned this, that the use of steroids is a, and this is a sta standard recommendation now in the guidelines. It's not recommended for improving outcome or reducing intracranial patient, pa in patients. It, it has no no use, no goal uh, in the, in the management of a head injury. Uh, this is one of the first studies on uh, the use of uh, steroids as, from Germany. They looked at the 300 patients receiving dexamethasone, IV, decadron, in other words. And uh, versus placebo, and they found that one year after treatment, there was no difference in outcome when, they, when these patients were examined serially for a, for a whole year. But there, of course, are the usual uh, uh, side effects of steroids, from uh, uh, hyperglycemia to uh, to uh, uh, reducing your immune defenses, amongst others. When we talk about seizure prophylaxis, that's still a popular. Uh, question in the management of head injury. The prophylactic use of dilantin or carbamazepine or any of the barbiturates or valproic acid is not recommended for preventing late post-traumatic seizures. How do we define late? 
nowadays we define late anything more than seven days. This is a, this is one of the first of these studies that came out and looking at head injury and the, and the, the use of a, a seizure medication. And there's, this has been repeated a number of times since then. And so let me summarize this. Um, Nancy uh, Temkin and her group looked at uh, 404 post-traumatic head injury patients, and these were patients with a GCS score of anywhere between 3 and 10, and then they have normal head CT scan. The randomized treatment with uh, Fenton, which is dilantin, as most of you know, or a placebo for a year with a two-year follow-up. In the first week after injury, 4% of the patients receiving dilantin had seizures compared to 14% taking placebo. After the first week, there's no significant difference between the rate of seizures in the two groups. So ever since then, plus the additional literature that's come in the last 20 years, we typically only uh, give seizure medication for seven days in the, in the head injured patient with uh, C positive CT findings. I thought I'd uh, throw in a couple of slides on feeding head injured patients. This is a, a study from the uh, from uh, Henry Ford Hospital, where they looked at 38 patients randomly assigned to either TPN or SEN. The TPN group got full nutritional support by seven days, where the, whereas the SEN group did not. There are significantly more deaths in the group that didn't receive full caloric replacement by the seventh day after injury. And I, I threw this slide in again just to re, re, remind you that there's a number of different guidelines, including operative guidelines for traumatic brain injury now. This is a this picture here I put in because it's a reminder to myself as well as to uh, those in the audience that uh, uh, trying to get uh, uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists and other medical specialists to embrace the guidelines has been a really difficult uphill battle. Uh, in a recent poll, only about 85% of neurosurgeons that do trauma are actually utilizing or placing ICP monitors. And only about 60 or 65 percent are using some kind of brain oxygenation monitor. So we still have, uh, we still have a, a battle. This is what your typical traumatic brain injury patient should look like. There should be all, a number of monitors at the bedside. This is hence the term multimodality monitoring. So, you know, how do you, you know, in the in the 21st century, I, I think we miss on critical information if we don't look at intracranial pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure, brain temperature, brain oxygenation, blood flow, and in some places, particularly academic centers, are doing microdialysis as well, the spinal fluid looking for uh, uh, markers, biologic markers. What's been the impact of traumatic brain injury guidelines? In 1995, when the when the guidelines for the first set of guidelines came out, they looked at 277 trauma centers, and only 28% were doing routine ICP monitoring. In 2005, 78% were using or uh, using ICP monitoring technology. Uh, prior to the guidelines and after the guidelines, you'll see the breakdown from one center that's that's uh, one big trauma center, right? The, the uh, if you, it's, this is kind of a difficult to understand slide, I guess, and I'm, I'll try to fix it for the next time. But uh, in the in the pre-TBI guidelines, they looked at 37 patients, 43% uh, or 16 patients were a Glasgow outcome scale of one, which means basically they died. Okay, 11 survived but were severely disabled, and only 10, about 27%, had good outcome. After the guidelines, where people in, in this particular center embraced the guidelines, uh, and then of 56 post-guideline patients that were evaluated, nine uh, were, had a Glasgow outcome scale of one, which represents 16%. Uh, eight had a Glasgow outcome scale of two to three, which represented only 14%. And a good outcome, Glasgow outcome scale of four and five, almost 70% of the patients. So you can see it's a marked difference. Almost twice as many uh, survived with good outcome but with the use of the institution of the guidelines. So uh, key recommendations. The baseline study for the severely brain injured patients should be intubated, normal volemic, normal capnic. Hyperventilation shouldn't be used routinely. Mantol should be reserved for acute control of intracranial pressure and always, always, always in bolus form. Uh, I wanted to show you a, a hypothetical, whoops, sorry, the cost analysis again from the uh, folks at Hopkins, well, they use the hypothetical system uh, 
uh, to look at the the the, uh, the testing of the train, brain trauma foundation guidelines for treatment of, of uh, TBI, and this is what they found in a hypothetical setting. They had uh, where where patients had adopted the, where states had adopted the brain trauma algorithms. They, that those states had 3,500 deaths. States that had not adopted the uh, uh, guidelines had almost twice as many, 7,000 deaths. The cost, you can see the differences in, in, in survivability, the savings in cost, the cost of rehab, the societal cost, uh, the implementation cost, and the overall potential savings. So there's a lot more than, than just uh, saving a few people. I could go on and on about this, but I think I'll stop here to answer some questions. Okay, very, very good, Roland. Thank you very much for a clear, those are great slides, for a clear presentation, and I'm sure I'm sure the students have lots of questions. Uh, do you want to start it off, Slavin? Uh, yes, of course, if my sound is okay. Yes, we'll tell you. Yes, we'll tell you. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, I wanted to ask you, uh, thank you for this great presentation. I think this will be a great future resource for uh, considering brain trauma management because uh, I admire the amount of in information that you gave us on the treatment of increased ICP which is a significant problem in these conditions and uh, they, they remind me of the ANS uh, uh, the ANS uh, ga gave some ga guidelines for the management of this uh, increased ICP the tiers that you we're talking about, but I wanted to ask you another thing. Uh, I uh, did watch some Stanford presentations in the field of neuroscience, and uh, it was quite magnificent. Uh, I think the, the the amount of knowledge that you have over there on Stanford. So I wanted to ask you: Do you perhaps know Robert Sapolsky, professor of neuroscience? I know Sapolsky, I know Sapolsky but, but I don't know very well. Yes, well, well, I was amazed by his uh, researches that he did on baboons. I mean, he was uh, he was kind of a very interesting professor who went to Africa to work with baboons, and and he did some significant research on on stress. So I just wanted to say that uh, even here in Croatia, Stanford is is quite admired, and we are uh, always try. It is a great, great resource for learning, and I think this uh, lecture is another addition to this. And uh, one question that you said uh, here about neurosurgical treatment of increased ICP. Uh, you mentioned the Gelberg, uh, if I'm pronouncing this correct, uh, the Gelberg uh, procedure. Uh, I'm wondering, this is the, the bilateral frontotemporal uh, decompressive craniectomy. So, how often is this procedure uh, d done today to release uh, increased ICP in after traumatic brain injury? Thank you. Yes, um, yes. Uh, you, you probably know that Dr. Schellberg later in life uh, became a, a tumor expert and a radiation expert, so that he was more interested in in research and, and treating pa brain tumor patients with uh, uh, different uh, forms of radiation, uh, uh, radio surgery, or early radio surgery, shall we say. But uh, going back to your question about bifrontal craniectomies, the, uh, it's more popular in the pediatric population than it is in the adult population. Most of us actually wound up uh, doing the uh, the uh, unilateral uh, craniectomy, uh, craniectomy uh, standard, standard decompressive craniectomy on the side that, of course, is most injured or most heavily injured. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So it is most commonly done in the pediatric population. In fact, there's an fact, article there's that an article came about, about uh, 10, uh, maybe 10, 15, 10, 15 years ago now, which led to the popularity. It was by the group at the University of Virginia. So if you look at pediatric uh, craniectomies, uh, University of Virginia, you'll see the seminal article. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answers and, and thank you for this uh, impressive lecture. Yeah, I have a question. Have a question. Thank you. From, from, from the beginning of the lecture, actually. Um, you mentioned that the, the Alaskan native population has a much higher trauma mortality than the general population. and uh, Why is that? Well, unfortunately, there's a there's it's the, there's a huge problem with alcohol. Okay. Uh, much like our own uh, um, 
native population here in the lower 48s. Two, uh, they haven't uh, embraced uh, uh, helmets or helmet laws okay. in uh, bicycles, motorcycles, snowmobiling, etc. Mm -hmm. um, three, there's a you know it's, it's even in a non-native population there's a high, you know there's a high incidence of uh, a trauma because a lot of the I guess it's it's almost cultural I, I, it sounds somewhat insulting perhaps but a lot of people that went to Alaska want to be individuals and individualists and not be told what to do. Hmm. Okay. Um, Simon, do you have a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Torres, on your presentation. I was really impressed with all of the, the seminal articles you presented. I'm sure that I'll be referring back to that so many times to, uh, to learn from this. Uh, my question is regarding the, uh, some of the cultural differences you probably noticed between the uh, trauma system at uh, Stanford and in Anchorage uh, or the medical system in general. I wonder if you could tell us some of the things you noticed uh, when you arrived. Well, I, I think that probably some of the some of the I, I think trauma in general, neurosurgeons have been slow or the the concept of organized neurotrauma and neurotrauma guidelines, even my own specialty has been slow to embrace. I still remember when uh, when, when I first started out in neurosurgery as an intern or resident, uh, it was almost always felt that people, neurosurgeons or those who that became neurosurgeons who um, didn't have particularly good hands or weren't strong, you know, strong uh, neurosurgeons in terms of their uh, backgrounds or their academic interests would ultimately by default fall into trauma. But that's absolutely not true nowadays where a lot of uh, uh, talented individuals are trying to advance that, that area or that field. Uh, with respect to uh, Alaska, um, they were one of the last to try to develop, and one of the reasons I went up there was to help with the uh, trauma system. The problem with Alaska is that the the distances are very far, and prior to my coming up there, a lot of uh, a lot of trauma uh, left uh, was flown into Anchorage and then flown to Seattle. The nearest uh, level one trauma center is in Seattle. Uh, I should say ACS level one trauma center. That's three and a half hours by jet from Anchorage. If you got hurt in one of the villages, you know four or five hours away by airplane, now we're talking about a nine or ten or twelve hour uh, before you get uh, significant or substantial assistance. By the time you arrive to Seattle, you're, you're, you're probably surviving only because uh, you, of your genetic uh, predisposition. I see. Thank you very much. And on a personal level, I was wondering if uh, uh, you had any difficulty adjusting in the summers or the winters and, you know, the differences in the long days or long nights. How was that? Well, that, it's interesting that you should mention that. It's not as bad in Anchorage as you know. You've been there before. Uh, it's only a few hours on each end. But in the in the in the summertime, it's particularly difficult for somebody like myself, who's an adrenaline junkie and you know a bit of a workaholic. You know, it'll be midnight or one o'clock in the morning. There's still light out. It makes it kind of hard for you to sleep. And so you say, well, I'll just stay up another hour and do some more work. But at the at the end of the day, it starts adding up. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question, uh, uh, Roland. Yes, what, what is it about the trauma system? Like, there's a, obviously, as you as you mentioned, there's a big difference in in uh, mortality and uh, survivability in a non-trauma center and a trauma center. What are the main factors? Is it the presence of a neurosurgeon close, or the or just people getting used to treating trauma that get good at it? What are the factors? I think the real factors are an organized system where everything is done by the algorithms and uh, there's there's uh, all of the uh, components that you need to main, to take care of a trauma patient, which, are, as, as you know, being an ED physician, are many. Uh, it, you know, it's it's rare to see an isolated uh, motor vehicle head trauma uh, in a motor vehicle accident. It's usually poly trauma. You need to have all of the uh, uh, pieces or chess pieces or players in in line to be able to address these patients. Okay. Very good. Okay, gentlemen, any more questions for Roland? No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Roland, I'd like to thank you for an excellent presentation. And, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we look forward to having many more of these with you. Thank you and good night, everybody. Have a good weekend.